absolutely. Yeah, great. Let's let's go around and see who's present, and who's not. If Alice isn't here, maybe he's somewhere on his bicycle on the way here. We've got everybody else. Chris is not here, so we're down to two people. But I think we, we have enough for a quorum. Uh, as always, the proceedings of this meeting are being recorded, both audio and video. Uh, I don't see the little there. If you don't have one of these little green cards, it tells you how to find these videos uh, online to take a look at. If you haven't got a card and want one, uh, you can pick one up now or, or later. Uh, so that brings us to public comment. Uh, as in all meetings, we said if the members of the public have something they'd like to say, we'd like to hear it. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you keep your comments uh, brief, maybe to a couple of minutes, three minutes, something like that. Tell us your name, uh, maybe what ward you represent or who you represent. And with that, uh, I'll open the floor to any public commentary that we might have. Uh, Fred Zimnock, Ward 3, and uh, I looked over the numbers uh, that came out at the last meeting. There was a table that came out, a spreadsheet actually, and I compared the numbers in the spreadsheet uh, to the previous one, and I noticed what I thought were fairly large discrepancies between the two spreadsheets. Uh, for example, um, for total impervious surface, the uh, new figures were 72 million versus old figures of 103 million. That's about a 40 percent difference. And the other difference I noticed was in large residential, the total surface new was 35 million, the previous surface is 28 million for about a 20 percent difference. So what's going on between the two tables? I don't think we're in a position that we probably can reconcile those those numbers, but, but we've heard them and, and we will look into those numbers and try to get figure out why they're different. Can can Doug or Jim talk to the because I, I know there was some change right in, away. Right away yeah. uh, and city municipal right. property and Yeah, but what about large residential? Let's that should that's not right away. We, we also uh, got a better parcel layer, so the parcel information was slightly different. Well, so slightly, this so is 42%. Well, that's not trivial, but it's 5 or 6%, I'd say. I'd have, to, I'd have to look at the numbers you're looking at. And, and There's a one off your table. Uh, I don't check, think we could be happy to check the numbers. Yeah. 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 Sure yeah. We we'll check the numbers. I don't think we could reconcile, and we shouldn't reconcile a spreadsheet here. I think that. We'll, have, we'll look into that. We'll, we'll get those numbers reconciled. It just, just makes me nervous. Understand. We, we accept that. Other comments? Uh, yes. Uh, my name is uh, David Hershey. So I'm with 22 Warburton Way and Ward 1. Uh, just a general comment. And this may, I'm not sure it does apply, but uh, I, I get, the, I'm not mistaken that you are looking at adopting regulations that would apply to uh, assessing a, a user charge of fee on areas that may or may be some uh, some um, lots that may have uh, additions, um, drive a permeable, in particular permeable material may be used. The city of Philadelphia has several years ago had proposed all new parking lots, for example, use uh, permeable material. So at some point down the line, if you assess a, a car dealer, for example, if a car dealer uses permeable replacement parking lot and uses permeable material, we need to come back and say, I want to do it. And I don't know, I haven't looked at your the different uh, proposals carefully enough to understand whether or not that would apply. I think that might be something you may want to take into consideration. Let me respond to our charge is to create as best as we can, to the best of our ability, a fair and equitable fee schedule uh, to pay for stormwater uh, and for flood prevention, flood control. We, we really have not been charged to create any regulations that's beyond the purview of this committee. I think uh, 
that would fall to city council or one of their other committees. But, but in the end, none of our recommendations will have anything to do with the regulation. We appreciate your comments, but just so it's clear about what our charge is. Just to respond, yeah, we're actually we're going to try to take that into account with credits going forward. So that that will actually be brought in into the fee structure is to look at those types of you know, future enhancements that might reduce runoff. So it's, it's a great point. It's it's looking forward as well as looking back to what some of the work people have already done. One of the many factors that are going into that. One of the permeable services that I've seen. There's one on Fruit Street. There's a Mr. Johnston on Fruit Street. He's got a big driveway. He's got turf stone. And basically, it's sort of like a half a driveway, half a lawn. Yeah. It's supposed to be very permeable. 42 Fruit Street. You're right, 42. <laughs> Let me respond. One thing, the other thing I want to say is our job is simply to recommend it's going to go through this unbelievably lengthy public process once we make our recommendation, in which there will be lots of time to talk about some of the details and... Uh, I haven't had a, I, I haven't had a chance to review all the material okay, that yeah. I have, all the hard work that any folks have done, and I appreciate that. But uh, just trying to yeah. set a broader framework for evaluating. And we welcome citizens, new citizens, who appear to come in on our work. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jack Fortier, um, and I live on Florence Road in Florence. Um, I'm a former finance director many years ago when I was a young man here for the city. Um, I was a board member and chairman of the Board of Public Works with Jim, Bob, and Terry uh, some years back. Um, I was formerly the chief financial officer at Hampshire College, and um, I own property in the city. And I've been following this close and I'm very interested. I first want to say I commend you all. Uh, you've, I, I've watched you on uh, pretty much all the videos and I know the hard work that you put into this and this is tough stuff. This is, uh, in my estimation, this is, uh, we're considering the biggest uh, change in financial policy the city has seen um, in decades. And, and having said that, any comment I make, and I'm going to try to be brief, um, I want to say that I for one understand the need in the city, like many of you do, and I am not an opponent of it, but yet I'm very concerned about how it's addressed and how the issue of equity is handled. And I, I want to say that, that in, in many respects, that the implementation of a fee is, is going to feel to most of us out there it's going to, and it, actually the literature says that a lot of the stuff that's up for everybody to review, that it's going to feel much more like a tax because it's going to resemble a tax much more. This is going to be permanent, it's not voluntary, and it's not readily measurable or controlled. So once, it's, this is a condition of the property that you own, and that feels much more like a tax, and people are going to view it as, what is my tax burden now, and what's it going to be after I'm impacted with this? The specific issue that I want to speak to is, is I want to appeal to everyone to keep in mind the concept of community as we move forward here. And by community, the discussion started some time back, um, like with the phrase that we're all in this together, which we certainly are. There's, uh, there's, no one wants to see this city like it was in 36 underwater. And, Many, many of the costs that have to be addressed here relate to flood control, some to the EPA mandates, the way I understand that will be adopted, but many, many to flood control. And everybody owns that in the city. This is part of everybody's responsibility. Everybody should participate, in my opinion, and I don't think that should be lost. It should be participate in a fair way, for sure. But as Terry pointed out in the beginning, if one funding source, and I'm not recommending that, that could, the way that this could be addressed is an override, override. We all know how the breakout would be if it was an override. This community is a residential community that breaks out 80% residential with valuation and 20% commercial. And so it, it would be predetermined how it would be funded. And so we go the fee route, and now we can bring in the tax exempts, which I think is legitimate as, 
uh, as, a, as relieving the burden for the residential and commercial community alone. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and I know you're working very hard at this, the proportion of burden of how this is distributed is extremely important. And so, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up, I'm going to be, the real point I'm, 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 I'm asking you to consider is, as you go through these, is, and I know your charge, it's not to make policy, but not to limit <coughs> by recommendation or vote by exclusions consideration of what the actual policy will be. Because probably the starting point for the next phase of the deliberations for the council and the public hearings is, is going to be what comes out of this committee. And so to the extent that there's any limiting parameters and considerations of who participates and who does not, this is a very important decision that you make at this level. <clears throat> and so even if you cannot come to one single consensus as this, we all agree on this, have enough latitude in your recommendation to where the policy debate can continue in a public forum on what equity is. There's no downside to that. You can still do your job, but let debate continue. Thank you. Other comments? Name and yeah, Mike Kirby, uh, 134 North Street, uh, Northampton. Um, I think I'd like to echo the sentiment he had. I feel that we step backward, and if you step backward once, I feel like we're going to step back another step with exempting the city from the cost of the of the stormwater because I don't want to give a chapter and verse but the biggest violator of green principles and good good runoff techniques is the city and the many projects that it has that we're going to address with these things. So I would urge you to include the city in, if only as an educational thing, or as a sense that was nobly expressed at the beginning, one of equity. Everybody, everybody is in this together. The second step I saw someone start to take, and hasn't come up for a vote yet, would be to exclude all the properties beyond the dike. Now, when you do that, you, you exclude the three-county fair development, um, which um, is, in the initial plan, was a big ticket item for the first two or three years. Um, so, just because it's beyond the dike doesn't mean it needs flood control, needs piping. In fact, it needs it more because it's beyond the dike, because it's in the, because it's in the green, it's in the floodplain. So I guess this is my comment. I, thank you very much. Other comments? Hearing none, let's let's go to the next item: uh, discussion and approval of the minutes. And uh, I, I don't recall seeing minutes from the last time. Did we get minutes? We did not. Okay. So let's, with the committee's pleasure, let's postpone that approval of last time's minutes until the very next meeting. Is that is that agreeable to the people at the table? Uh, I think. In light of what Jack has said and Mr. Kirby has said, which really pertains to the last minutes, I think it's really it's important for us to maybe discuss the fact that we have, you know, we voted one way at the, you know, several weeks ago. We took another <laughs> vote, and and it would not be a good thing to keep to do that going down. And I'm not even sure that you know if we reconsider what what Jack just said, you know the 
taking her off the table for debate is not our job. So I think maybe the thing to, cons to consider is as we do our models is, you know, if it's decided to exclude, this is what we would recommend, and if it's decided to keep it in, this is what we would right. recommend. And the, the committee, or the majority of the committee felt that it would be appropriate to do X, but we did not take yeah. it off the table. I think that might be a more fair and equitable way for us to act uh, as a task force. How does the committee feel about that? Hey, Chris? Just want to raise, I, I think you made a good point. And one of the things we might want to start thinking about along these lines is what is our recommendation going to look like and how are we going to contribute to it as individuals? And what I'm thinking now is sort of like dissenting opinions or, you know, so where there, where there are gray areas or where we think um, um, an explanation of our deliberation will shine some light on what our thinking was moving forward, we may want to start thinking along the lines of what it is that we're going to actually present. Well, so, that's a great idea. It, it was my thinking if when we get through tonight the discussion on credits and exemptions and on the commons and on the caps, we'll be in a position, I think, then to maybe say, okay, uh, how many opinions do we have on each of these subjects and then begin to put that together. But, yeah, I, I the committee should decide, but I see no reason to have a single recommendation there, the portfolio, if you will. Jim? I think one of the important things that you're going to learn tonight is going to be the weight when we start talking about flood plain and what the elevation is. And then you can consider what should be, what shouldn't be, and where it is. This is a very, very important part of what you can do in the flood plain and what you can't do. And, you know, where is it? Okay. Uh, since you're not approved the minutes, uh, let's go to uh, six. And I don't know, I've seen no new ideas on fee algorithms come in from committee members. And if there was any, uh, I can speak to that. Is that right? There was. Um, we had, uh, staff had developed a, uh, a scenario for uh, an ERU style system based on information uh, that we got from Rick Clark. So we took information that he provided and came up with a, uh, a summary uh, fee calculation sheet like we did for the other methods. And we included Rick's um, proposal in a table with the other fee proposals. So that was um, something that we had received for the last meeting and something that we had just developed and finished today. And do we need to discuss that or will we, do we have copies of those? Uh, are we happy to discuss it when we look at this? Table. Well, I And while they're passing, I, I wanted to make one comment. I personally owe Bob Reckman. Uh, a thank you, and also thank you on behalf of the committee, because Bob organized this uh, visit to the flood control facility, and as a result, we got a first page front page. Gazette article, front page article, and I don't think we could have hoped for more publicity than that. And I felt that the article was relatively unbiased. The first uh, sentence was a little. Uh, uh, provocative, but but the rest of it I thought was pretty well done, and so Bob, I want to thank you because uh, you, if you hadn't done this, this wouldn't have happened. And I and it was so I was so pleased to have a bunch of you who've never been there. She is silly. It's such a cool thing. And uh, yeah, no, well, uh, okay, we've just been received here a, a updated spreadsheet. Does this have, this doesn't have Rick's on it, but the second page does, right? It does. It does. Oh, okay, I see it. Okay, I'm with you. So now we have all the uh, uh, fee schedules, proposals that committee members have put forward. And I just want to point out to you, Doug and Jim really worked out this year. It's, it's you know, my, my intention to make sure that we have that in front of us, but they did all the work. 
Well, we'll give you all credit for it. Then. Yeah. We'll put, however many names you'd like on that, we'll put them on it. Okay. But for the time being, for this sheet, yeah, you won't you won't enter tonight. Jim, Jim, to save yourself some work, you might as well drop this McGrath original. All the property. It's really way off. <laughs> And where do we see the city property? The Turfield Road City Conservation Area, most of the way to the bottom. Yeah, it's separated out. So it's not the best. So I imagine each property is going to have a number. So it doesn't recognize our vote of excluding city property from our vision? It does not. It does not. If I understand it, it does not. It does not. We have another one that does. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was just great. Apple apple apple. Apple. And I this was that would raise the that, okay. that would raise the ERU figure. So this compares all of the fees that we're in. So same basis. So Doug, when we get these, can we know what's included or what's excluded? With in, in this? Yeah, when we get these. This is the same as last week. It's the, Says, I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, well, just to keep everyone and, and for myself, when I look at this, I, I know we voted to exclude city property last week, and now we're looking at a draft that includes a city property. Either way is fine, as long as everyone's clear that one draft excludes and one draft includes. I had a different interpretation of how we voted last. Okay. I made the motion, and my motion said. The city's not going to get a bill. That we're not going to ask the city to give us a check. That doesn't mean we can't include city property in our calculation, our formula. And that's what Terry and I both did in our formula. We attempt to include all publicly owned property under a different billing structure. But the city didn't get a bill. That's the, what we voted last week, I think. But that doesn't say we're not going to take account of the city and bill somebody, all of us other than the city, for that expense. Perhaps with a different factor of how you figure that out. Is that what you're calling like common? Yes. It's being divided that's up right. amongst all of us. So we have a, one, a common fee and a partial fee. And that's the source of those ideas in Terry and my model, I think. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Now, the way I understand this, if I am understanding it correctly, for the single two family and three family, it looks like just a, a flat bill. Single family is one ERU, two family is two and three family. Well, not not straight two, but 1.35 for three family. It's not if your single family has more property or less property. It's just a one. It's an average, it's an average okay. for that size. So everybody in a single family would pay $101. Okay. With this table, which includes city property. And let me point out one other thing. The Dan's model also has a common fee. It's calculated differently and conceptualized differently. But it does have, right there, it's a partial fee and a common fee. So it, that attempt to take care of the same issue in a different way, I think. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, yes and no. The common <laughs> commons fee, as it turns out, and as I said previously, mm -hmm. is actually, it's, a, it's proportional because it's, it's just, it's added proportionally to everybody's. Okay. So it really doesn't need to be there. It shows up as a, as a fee, but it's the same rate. Therefore, you know, again, if you eliminate the comments, and the price goes up, you have that amount. Yeah, okay. So Bob, my clarification is that we're going to include the city property, but we're not building the city. That would be my hope. Yeah. If I understood the motion, the motion was this. That we wouldn't send the city a bill and then somebody receive a check back from the city for the bill. We just weren't going to do that. That that was exactly my intention. I did not mean we shouldn't. And that's what I pay for what the city does. Yeah, the way I understood it, we weren't going to bill the city, but whichever one of these fee structures we come up with, it might include 
the city in, in the structure, or it might not. Yeah. It just depends which one of these we decide yeah. on. Yeah. So in essence, as I understand, eliminating the commons fee is really in that's not what we said. No, they, they handled it differently. Right. But in effect, it's the same thing. We, we are no. we're sharing no. the common charge. That's right. And we disagree about what the common charge is and about how we should share it. But all the models attempt to Identify. handle the commons costs. Not all Except models. Ruth's. Yeah. Ruth's does so the other three explicitly do. And what you call the commons. And we have to talk later about what the commons is. Because now, you know, if the city is yeah. part of the commons, for me it wasn't. Yeah. The city yeah. is okay. Yeah. So it, it changed nice all of my numbers could, changed like, for that. You're year. saying, uh, David, that if we can compare apples to apples. Yeah. So even if we have alternative methods that include or disclude the, uh, the commons, I, I'd like to see those lined up together. So, you know, Bob, you specifically have a, a, you know, a commons charge yeah. and somewhere in, in the options that don't specify a commons right. charge, that charge is in there. You know, so I, I'd just like to make sure that we you know, either separate out all the common charges or include them. If you look at the actual calculations for each of these numbers, for Terry and my numbers, it's calculated if the numbers are in the big file, not on the spreadsheet. So it is explicitly calculated for each three models included. I had also put in this week a request for um, building surface area, but which was in the email I sent to you guys. There was no way to really do a model to see how it would turn out. But again, looking for a way to overcome sort of the GIS limitations, which have a certain amount of built-in error, um, or the average um, approach, which is sort of just assigning values to properties, would be something that is concrete that pretty much you, know, you can get behind as a realistic number. Um, that is, I, I, at this point, can't really, I guess can't go forward because we don't really have those numbers really <coughs> accessible from a database, although I'm pretty sure that they're, or they're in the assessor's uh, database, so it would just be a matter of getting it out. So that was a pure Building square footage model, nothing else. Or residential, because okay. the, the perspective that I had on that, which may, again, may not be true in every case, but that the building is, is representing a, sig a significant, if not the sub most substantial part of the impervious area, and that it is a way to capture a real number. Uh, and that then you can also use buildings for commercial, because we have those numbers, yeah. plus parking lots, which are no, which are in many cases much larger than the buildings and should be included. But if your model did not include them, did it? And maybe I misunderstood. No, it would. Yes, it would <coughs> include parking okay. lots, but I can't go okay. through and do the model actually from a number standpoint because we don't have the data. Okay. So it involves the actual measuring of all big parcels, <coughs> impervious building area, and per other impervious. Right. Areas. Well, the building. Plot footage, which I think we already have for assessor's purposes, the ground plot area is already, from what I can see on the assessor's cards, that's there. Um, but, you know, the parking lots would have to be a GIS exercise. What we don't have is a database for all those square footages in a the database so that we can pull those numbers out and go use them for something. Now we have a pile of cards. Here. Well, it's, I mean, it's, on, it's online. It's, I, I'm well, yeah, assuming I'm that sure. it's in a database and it's just a matter of extracting yeah, it. Extracting it usable. Um, but. Okay. Alex? Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, my assumption on the common sphere, not assumption, one of the problems I've had with the common sphere and the way we've been trying to allocate that cost is that it seems to me that that should be borne almost equally by population. We all get approximately the same use that commons fee, uh, you set a value, whatever the value we're, we're trying to arrive at, charge that to the city property and split that up somehow evenly. I think that seems a fair way to look at the commons. So for a property owner like Cool Deck, that would be that would be a one. And that same as yours would be a one. 
I guess so. It's a difficult uh, for the separate comments, but the, the majority of the fee would be wrapped up in the, sure. the parcel itself. I have, you know, again, the details. But in general, it's not something that's based on your impervious or pervious surface of the size of your lot. It's more, it's really the cars that you generate. The school that you go to. So schools that you go to. There's no one of one of the things that I was that I put out in the in the spreadsheet that I put together was sort of this fair and equitable, and that's that is a perfect place to look at and start with what's fair and equitable. Because we have, I think we need to sort of do that with all of the different approaches that we're taking to even include them for consideration as to whether it's it's fair and equitable. Are there any plans that have been put forth that seem unfair at this point? Does anyone have a feeling about that? <clears throat> if I could just make a comment, I'd like to speak to the issue of uh, rightly or wrongly in this community, historically we've selected billing fees for water and sewer and I think solid waste <clears throat> that are unit based and evenly applied for large users and small users. It's a little squirrely on solid waste because we have some discounts for the, the big commercial haulers if they pay their bill promptly. But historically, as I think I said in an earlier meeting, <coughs> the water rate for Cooley Dickinson or Coke or my house, it has the same unit price as does sewer. So I guess I would it doesn't mean we have to do similar unit pricing for stormwater, but that is the precedent in the community. So I just put that out there. To bill it based on usage. <clears throat> Attach it to some per square foot unit. This, this speaks, I think, to Alex's point, I think. Right, well, if 70% of the property, 70% of stormwater cost would be shared on uh, what I would hope the most accurate uh, per square foot permeable, impermeable right. formula. But the commons fee is different. It's not, it, or at least I have, haven't been able to wrap my yeah. mind totally around it. It seems to me different. It's, it seems much more everybody uses the city approximately the same. And I think you're like a transmission right. fee for, elect, you know, for electricity. There's a transmission fee plus your, your billing based on let me understand this. <coughs> Terry, yes. in the case of sewer, in the case of water, those are measured amounts. Correct. Right? Yeah. In, in this particular case, uh, that's not the same sort of thing. We're not going to have a measurement like we do on so many gallons of water. That's to me. This is a uh, well. We a, have a we do have accurate measurements of what the city owns as a number of square feet. <clears throat> there could be a discussion about are we talking about impermeable surface compared to gross impermeable surface? Is it total square feet of city property versus gross? you know, the total square foot citywide of, of all property. But we can, in fact, um, articulate a ratio of how much of the property in the city is owned by the, by the city, the, how much is municipal property. And that, so, in fact, we can come up with a, an accurate percentage of the land mass that's municipal. That I understand, but the water is a charge for consumption. Right. Gallons go in and gallons come out. And in this case, uh, we're not consuming square feet or not measuring. We're, we're assessing the feet, in principle at least, against some square footage, right? And that's quite different than measuring things with a meter. That is a completely different thing. I mean, I'm a scientist. And well, I, so I when had it comes to measuring things, uh, I feel pretty comfortable about, so, okay, your yeah. gallons are measured. And, and uh, I had argued that if you calculate the percentage of property in the city that's municipally owned that you could 
you'd be using square footage, oh, oh, that I you could then apply square footage to the, uh, the resolution of that amount. I accept that part. I just think that when you compare it to measuring gallons of water consumed, that's, uh, to me, that's quite a different thing. Somebody comes out and looks at that meter and they know how many gallons that I run on my tomato plants or wherever, whatever I might have done with it. And flood control and, 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 uh, and stormwater is... Uh, right, but we're going to be using, we're assuming that the rain is falling everywhere. Sure, we're no, no, I understand. By but, proxy as yes, no, I accept that part. Let me go back to Alex's point about if we could do it by the head, that would be the perfect way to do it. I agree with you in principle, but the city has no practical means to achieve that goal. Zero. Go by the head. If you could bill every person in the city, every in the city, 20 bucks. Including visitors? No, resident. Somebody who lives here. Person who lives in the city. All the citizens of Northampton. Just bill them 20 bucks. That, that would be the perfect way to do it. That was the point. Whatever the number happens to be, so. yeah. right? Yeah, but the city has no way to accomplish it. Simply does not possible for the city to do this. So, as attractive an idea as it is, I resign myself to the problems of the bureaucracy. Well, I think we've discussed uh, Rick's uh, model here a little bit, but we have the next item is that Jim was going to. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, the impact of exclusions and credits. And I believe Wayne Fighton is here. Yeah, he's here, and he's probably going to add on some. So let's, let's reverse those. And have you, Wayne go which first. way do you want to do this? <laughs> Wayne Wayne's so much more important than I am. I think it would be. <laughs> no, 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 I don't buy that. No, no, no. We, we set the agenda here, just to understand. The committee gets us to sign. I think Wayne uh, has a Another meeting? The the city committee. Council, a little while before. Yeah. Yeah. How does the committee feel about Wayne going next? Let Wayne go oh, first. Right. He's got Bye. counsel. Let Wayne go You're first. You're on. Wayne. Does everybody have a copy of the email that we sent with Wayne's? Yes. I yeah. No, I don't. Uh, I'll Thank you. Here, take this. I've got one. Okay. Oh, I did. Give me a second. Should I just start? Okay. You'll have the floor. So, I mean, I've now you listen to your discussion about what's exempt and what isn't exempt, and um, so. Let me start with going through this table and what it goes through, and then you know answer whatever questions you have. But you know, I think the premise for me in terms of open space is most of the open space sort of absorbs more stormwater than it consumes in terms of services. Um, it's not true for all of them; the open space is different. But just an example on your spreadsheet that was just passed out. One of the examples is Turkeyville, um, which it shows up. I think what the acreage was when that one was done, but it's now about 700 acres of land that is protected. In the spreadsheet, it showed up as um, 7.6 acres of impervious area. My guess is that most of that area that's impervious is either exposed rocks or the quarry itself. The quarry, when it was an operating quarry, was obviously impervious, but it's now become a, a pond, water is collecting there. So even though it's impervious, it's in fact absorbing water, and so when it rains, the pond level goes up. When it doesn't rain for a, water, a while, the water slowly sinks into the ground. So it's, you know, it's doing exactly what we want to do. It's, it's absorbing water and creating less impact. That's true for all the open space to some extent. So some, you know, frankly, if you're trying to mitigate stormwater, one of the best things to do is buy more open space. Um, some, some are less. So let me just go through this table based on that. Um, so, you know, the, the first city-owned property is conservation property. This is land that's basically pristine. There might be a, a walking trail on it that's, you know, four feet wide or six feet wide. Um, but for the most part, it's pristine, and it basically doesn't need any stormwater services. And they say it's absorbing water. So lots of, like, you know, lots of water comes down North Farms Road, goes into Fitzgerald Lake, and then Fitzgerald Lake buffers that water, so there's less stormwater impact on their end. So most of the conservation areas fits in that, that category. Um, second category is recreation areas. Now these are have very small improvements in terms of impervious service, 
although obviously fields have a lot, are, are a lot, even though fields are green, they let water go into the ground more slowly than many of the existing conditions that were there before. Um, but they're still largely, you know, there's certainly a lot less impacts than, than most development. Parks and trails, so these are like the, you know, everything from Pulaski Park to the portion of bike path that city owns. Um, they obviously have a greater percentage of impervious surface, still less than development, but you know, still mostly green. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the state and federal side, I don't even know if you have the option of, of charging them, but basically it's the equivalent. So there's a bunch of different state properties in town, everything from agricultural land, most of the state hospital, um, up to state parks and wildlife areas. And those areas are either, again, totally pristine, like uh, Rainbow Beach, down to things like the state hospital that are agricultural fields, but again, mostly are dealing with drugs. Federal level is, again, pretty pristine. Um, then there's, there's a lot of land that's owned by land trusts and nonprofit, and they sort of mimic the same thing the, the city does. So the biggest holder is Mass Audubon, for example, um, and that property is, you know, basically like conservation land. It's allowing most of the water to, to sink into the ground. Um, well, then going all the way to Child's Park, which is a private park, and it's sort of like Look Park in the sense that, you know, a lot of it's paved, but it's still a majority that's impervious. Um, the, the next category is these permanent restrictions. These are restrictions on private property and public property, but you probably care more about private property. So somebody in town might own 100 acres of forest, which they want to keep in timber production, and they own the property, but they've sold the city or the state or a nonprofit a restriction. And what they're saying is, we're giving up the right to ever develop this property, to ever add impervious surface there, but we still own the property, we can still use it as a working landscape. So those are what's called conservation restrictions, and for the most part, these are large tracts of wooded land, but just so it's clear, not exclusively, we're about to get a conservation restriction on the courthouse, the, um, the council of government, the old courthouse law. Obviously, that's not a pristine forest, but you know, 99% we're talking about are the big forested areas and a couple of these very small areas elsewhere. Um, agriculture preservation restrictions are sort of the cousin. These are privately owned farmland, or in some cases, city-owned farmland, that somebody else holds a restriction. And again, the land can never be developed. It can only be used as farmland. So the land for most of these are private, but the APRs guarantee the property will be developed. Um, and as I said earlier, Farmland clearly is less permeable than the wetlands or forest, but it's still pretty permeable. I mean, it's still like, you know, the majority of the water is going down to the ground, although not nearly as much as a forest or wetland. Or or um, and then we have a whole, a whole category of temporary restrictions. So the state has these chapter programs. The, the jargon for these is current use taxation programs, which somebody says, I'm not going to develop my property. And as long as they don't develop the property, they get a greatly reduced tax, about 25% of what their taxes would be otherwise. Um, and they can always change their mind anytime they want. There's some penalties that they change their mind. Um, but until they change their mind, the land is conservation or forestry or agriculture. Um, and, and I think I'd argue that all of those are, in essence, net benefits. In fact, for stormwater mitigation, one of the things we do for subdivisions in town for special permits is ask for open space as a way to, to mitigate some of the stormwater impacts from the project. So I can go more in terms of my own thoughts, but I, I don't know if, what you're looking for here. I have a question. Um, so in a 50 or 100 year storm event, do most of those properties flood and contribute to flooding? I mean, at, at a point where, because again, a lot of what we're trying to look at is flood control, and I understand in the smaller rain events, they're preventing some flood control. I mean, they're, they're adding to flood control. Yeah. But in the larger events, all bets are off, and they actually contribute through their runoff. So I guess there's a couple ways to look at it. One is, in a big storm event, obviously, water's falling everywhere, so there's no question of water's leaking site. If the standard is, which is the standard we use for a regulatory standpoint, that we expect impacts to be no greater post-development than pre-development, then no, they're not having impacts. That yes, in a 100-year storm, water's flowing everywhere, but that they're absorbing the same amount of water, most of the conservation land and agriculture in particular, are absorbing the same amount of water that they've been absorbing for 12,000 years. 
Um, and so they're not adding to, you know, what I always worry about is the incremental piece. If I build a huge building in the floodplain, then I'm displacing water and somebody else's property is going to flood more. Or if I put a big parking lot in an area which rains, that water's running off more quickly. So we're not talking about those activities. Um, and, and then I guess the, the third way of looking at it is these are sites, so even the recreation fields. So Sheldon Field, which is in the floodplain, Florence Fields, in, uh, Meadow Street, which is mostly in the floodplain. Um, they're still absorbing, they're, they're holding a huge amount of water during a 10, 100 year, and 500 year flood. Obviously, that water is moving across the property, but they're clearly not generating water. So, no river floods, and because it's a field, the water can sit there and not knock down a house and not knock down a street or whatever. So, I, I mean, I guess to me that the threshold is in part, you know, is the base the difference between pre development and post development? You know, the conservation land, for the most part, doesn't need floodplain, doesn't need uh, flood control structures. It, it doesn't get damaged. I mean, recreation land's a little bit different, but the conservation land doesn't really get damaged by floods. So, so that really is maybe the key from our standpoint, is whether or not flood control actually does, has any benefit to those, right. Right. those properties. If it has no benefit, then maybe they should not have and obviously, some of this is management. So, you know, the area which we've spent the most amount of money in post-flood reconstruction is Maine's Field. And Maine's Field is a very manipulated environment where, as far as I know, there was once a river channel that went through there, it was flooded. Um, but even Maine's Fields, DPW has made a lot of changes in terms of saying the grass in Maine's Field isn't what erodes. It's basically the infield area in the baseball. So they've done a lot of work sort of dealing with breakaway fences and so, so even the recreational area is easier to deal with to say you can harden these areas so water can run across it. If you, if you look at Florence Fields, it's under construction now, the reason the soccer field is on the right side and the baseball field is on the left side is the right side is the 10-year floodplain. Um, and so we expect a fair amount of flooding and the soccer fields are pretty tough to deal with flooding. The baseball field on the left side, which climbs into the 100-year flood and a portion out of all the floodplain, and that's the area where this bare soil where we do the biggest problems of flooding. Thank you, Wayne. Your, your crystal clear really helped, uh, helped me figure out some things. And one of the things you're so crystal clear is that will the residents of the city take Wayne's crystal clear explanations to use them to dispute the bill they get from the city? Because if I have a quarry on my property that's no longer active, and some people do, and now it's a pond, are they going to use that to dispute why they're getting a bill from the city? Because of that explanation? Yeah. So, so having this so clear to me, which I, I appreciate, I'm not in any way negative, I think it leads us also down the path to where we're learning the city is exempt from it, if that's what the committee recommends and the city council recommends. And that's what's going to leave the city residents an avenue to dispute why they're getting charged in the city. So if I understand correctly, most of this property pays a much reduced but still still measurable tax. So all the public property, so on, on this list, city, state, federal, uh, city, city land trusts pay no taxes. Okay. Um, state and federal government both pay a payment in lieu of taxes, which frankly is not very much money. <laughs> okay. So I, <laughs> we get something. Um, the APR and CR pays taxes, but very reduced. Okay, um, that's what I was getting at. The ones who do pay taxes, it might be 10 or 20 percent of what their tax. So for be. forest land, it's 25 percent okay. of what other people would pay. Okay. For ag land and recreation land, it's based on the value of it. So you look at if it's an income approach, like an apartment right. building, the income approach here is corn. How much income do you make from? And that, that might be corn. about what percent? About a quarter. 25 is what I use in my numbers. Okay, so, so that's an important point to. to no, so we definitely, if we want to exempt this land, we can charge them something for whatever flight control benefit they draw. Uh, Dan, in uh, one of the models that he presented to us, uh, had a factor. And I, if I get the factors wrong, Dan, you can get it right for me, okay? But as I remember it, uh, the factor for uh, uh, impervious surface was like 0.9 or something like that. 0.15. Point. 
for impervious in, point 0.9. Point 0.9, okay. and for impervious, point 0.15. Yeah. And what that tells you is that there is runoff from pervious material. And so a huge tract of land area multiplied times this factor could easily generate as much runoff as a parking lot. And it is not correct from the physical point of view to suggest that it doesn't. Because there's plenty of data out there that you could go and run an experiment and show that if you had a box of sand and you poured water on it, some's going to run off and some's going to run through. And then if you had a box of asphalt, more of it would run off, according to what Dan's model was, 90% or something like that. And that's exactly right. If I so can, we, need, we need to think about at least the physical facts of the situation. If I can add, though, I mean, I've heard a couple of you say this. It's absolutely true. Water runs off everything. Um, but it goes back to, do you need the services? So the conservation land, to, to a large extent, the agricultural land, um, it, it's not making things any worse than it's been for 12,000 years. It's not impacting other, other projects. So to me, if you build, let's say we suddenly resettle Northampton. Nobody lives here, and you move into the community. The existing conditions are the pre pre-existing conditions. It's not government's responsibility from my standpoint to make everything dry and to say the water that's been going here for 12,000 years isn't your problem. It's our responsibility to deal with these extra waters that we're adding from development. But this comes back still to, you know, the, what Emory just said about sort of impervious nature. Those, all those lands as being residents, right? Somehow being within the confines of the city, we still have this shared responsibility. We're all in this together. We need to participate in some way. I still think you come back to that, no matter how you slice it, and maybe that commons fee as a separate, you know, fee to take that into account is is one of the ways. Yeah, that I just don't buy uh, at least the totality of your argument. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's. Um, the conservation land may not need the services the city provides, but the housing that we've allowed to be built in wetlands and in, in the path of flood it needs, needs to be protected. And that's, I mean, that's why we have a whole dike system and a pumping station, because we've built in a place where 12,000 years ago the Indians would have not. I, I don't disagree. I guess, I, I, to me, it it's, goes back to the equity issue. Is who should be paying, to me, are the people who, the, the uses that are in the wrong place or the uses that are making floods worse. So I don't disagree at all. We need a dike system, you know, and, and we, need, we need pipes or I mean, everything we, we do, we need. But it, it's really a matter of the person who benefits paying for it. But if everybody comes, you know, they use the roads, they use, you know, they're using in some level services uh, that have parking lots and buildings that have runoff. Um, and, in the, and these properties, regardless, at some point, contribute runoff. They have to, to the overall watershed. There's going to be some impact from every property. I think every property, you know, this is one of the things we started off with, every property participates in some way. Yeah, I guess it's philosophical. I mean, yeah. To me, it's the P pre versus post development that I think everyone should be paying for the post development changes they make. <coughs> Jim, Jim had a comment here. Wayne, uh, there's a couple of things that we haven't built into this yet. And I remember when I was on the city council, we had a new uh, land plan that was passed for the disturbance of an acre, two acres, three acres, and what they had to do in our, what year was that? Five or six years ago, I lose track of time, but it's a ballpark. Be, okay. Maybe it's longer but than that. It would, when we start considering exemptions, uh, many of the things that were done would bite into the fee that the homeowner is going to pay because they've done so much work on their own land to see that they control the runoff. The other uh, thing is uh, what is considered the floodplain. Now, to me, Island Road is in the floodplain. 
the Hilton is in the flood plain. The new building that they built down there on Route yeah. 5 is in the flood plain. The fairgrounds is in the flood plain. And those properties that are below uh, are on that side of the dike. And there's two or three small streets and a dozen houses. To me, those particular pieces of property get absolutely nothing from the flood control system. No protection whatsoever, unless you can tell me what advantage they're getting from it. So, as you know better than I do, we sort of have two patterns of floods. We have the very flashy floods on the relatively small streams, Mill River, Manhattan River, Parsons Brook, and then we have larger storm events along the Connecticut River that we always have much more warning, um, but obviously cover a much bigger area. Um, and so clearly the people who are in the, um, the smaller watersheds, they clearly benefit from a lot of the things that we're doing because if we stop stormwater going upstream, you know, if you're along the Mill River and you're on the edge of the floodplain, you really worry about development happening further upstream. The Connecticut River, obviously, almost no matter what we do, we're not going to have an appreciable impact on the Connecticut River. That's going to happen in snow melt and Connecticut. And, and, and so there, the Connecticut River, I agree, they don't get many services. So when you're talking about the Connecticut River floodplain, I agree with you. When you're talking about the small river floodplains, I think they do get some benefit from things that we do. Well, you might think. You're exactly you say right. that them. So, so if I'm building a floodplain, I can see, I can see, possibly, Island Road getting some benefit from what is coming out the mill. Uh, and, I, and I don't ever remember during a local rain <clears throat> where where it affected Island Road. No, but I, so I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't know. so the area basically within the interstate, so nor the dike system for, for a while, the area within the interstate and within, you know, uh, uphill from the dike system, very much benefits from what the city does, obviously because of the dike, but also in terms of controlling development. So, it, so um, you know, if you do something good on Bridge Street, it has less impact not only along Bridge Street, but in the fairgrounds area. Yeah. So there's a connection that's there. Yeah. Island Road, I agree with you. Island Road, I don't think much we do has a big impact on them. Because they're you say something good, do something good. What do you mean? So when we build dike systems, when we maintain our stormwater system, when we have regulations to make sure that people aren't paving the entire property without mitigating it, we have a big effect on what's the localized flooding that is flooding out of the floodplains and on flooding on these small floodplains along the Mill River, along the you know, Manhattan River. So, so the city has a lot of different actions from bricks and mortar projects to regulatory programs that have a big effect and help people's property from being flooded. So um, with that, when you, when you say, Jim, that they don't benefit from the system, does, I, I forget who said it, but doesn't everybody benefit when the city doesn't flood, even if your property is... No, because they flood. Right. Right. So, so if you're on Island Road, right. or you're by the airport, almost no matter what we do, right. we'll have no effect. Because 99% of the water coming, 99.9% .9 of the water is coming down the Connecticut from places upriver from us. So our activities really don't really help them. Wait, but, are, you, are you making the point that they shouldn't have to pay anything? No. I'm well, just, where are you headed with this? Oh, well, yeah, we're trying to answer But like, where, where are you going with that? I mean, explain well, so, what, what's the takeaway? I... I I totally get the lack of information and the, the difficulty of, rising, of getting perfect information. So what I'm going to say, we'll totally ignore that for a second. But in an ideal world, if we have the perfect information, to me, we should do those assessments. We should be saying, yes, a quarry that's privately owned that's holding water shouldn't be paying a fee. A quarry that's privately owned that's shedding water should be paying a fee. A rooftop should be paying. Now, I don't think we can get all those numbers. But, but to me, the ideal system is the closer we get to it, the closer we get to the principle of the user paying. So yes, in that ideal world, the people who aren't really benefiting from our structures to pay. Now, you know, I used to live in Vermont, and Vermont had this weird structure where you had sewer fees. I don't think we had this, I don't think so, but we had sewer fees and we had sewer benefit fees. The idea was, I lived in Montpelier, the very fact that we had a centralized sewage system 
helped me even though I didn't live in a place with a centralized sewer system. So that's your sort of like your common fees. Well, so you don't reject the common fees? No, I don't reject the common fees. I think it's a matter of degree to me. I, I think you want to get as close as you can to use your pays, but the, and then the common fees is a separate thing. Just a minute. I've seen Mr. Kirby's hand up several times. I, last time I made this point, and I didn't tonight, and I'm sorry I didn't, but, but we agreed last time, and I meant to uh, say it tonight, that when the committee is discussing it, the committee of the people at this table, we weren't going to have the public participate in that discussion. After this session, before we go home, if the public is here and they want to make a comment about what they've heard, <clears throat> then we'll listen to that. But uh, it seems to me the committee has the charge to sort this issue out. I apologize. I was and, hiding behind. And that we uh, come to some consensus. Now, we've asked Wayne to come here at our pleasure. And we asked Jim to come here at our pleasure. And so we feel comfortable talking because we see them giving us data. But Beyond that, uh, we are trying to deliberate amongst ourselves as a committee. So with that said, let's go back and deliberate. <laughs> so Jim, I think I agree 100% that the property beyond the dikes doesn't get any bit of benefit from the former flood control system. It does get benefit from being part of us. Well, that's something that that's we... A, so I can see that getting some kind of bill, yeah. but it certainly shouldn't reflect anything other than the common. And, and we, and Chris has done, I can't wait for his presentation tonight because he's done a beautiful job on four different places and what they allow for exemptions and so on. And, and it's really going to be enlightening. And, and, I, and I hope everyone stays so that they can listen to the type of exemptions that are being offered around the country. Let's go back. Do we have more questions of Wayne? I mean, he's got another commitment tonight, so I'm no. not, not, I don't necessarily want to hold him up. So let's just go around the table here. Anything for Wayne? Bob? Alex? No. no. Ruth? Chris? John? Megan? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have none. Thank, Thank you, you very Thanks much. much. I appreciate Wayne. your coming. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, now, the next item we I have. Can I, I have yeah. a comment on the same topic? Sure. Go but ahead. I didn't want to hold Wayne up. I just want to say, because everybody seems to be going on the, the comments, everybody seems to think that that's a good idea. I just want for the record to state that I don't agree with including the commons. Um, it's not in my fee structure. Um, something came up earlier about, you know, using your electric bill, using your, your, um, rain, your, your water bill and all that. I look on it the same way. If I get a bill, I want to be able to, to do something about that bill, just like your electric bill. I can take steps to reduce my electric bill. There's going to be credits on my bill. If this commons, I can't do anything about reducing a commons bill. And if I'm a homeowner out there and we present this to them, they're going to look at this commons portion of it and know that they can't do a single thing to take steps to try and reduce that part of it. And it's going to go over like a lead balloon. But that is, I mean, Fundamentally, there has to be this, this baseline that is there, that if you, you know, if, we're sh a sh if it's a shared responsibility, we don't get out of it. That's not an option. Because we have, because no matter what the home does, there's still, there's no way they're going to eliminate 100% in that flooding condition. This is why I keep coming back to the 1500 year flood because all bets are off. You can have 100 rain barrels, you can have a cistern, you can do uh, you know, pervious pavement, you can put a green, you know, a, a green roof on, 100 year flood, you're contributing to the flooding, it's part of the commons, it's we're all gonna suffer as a result of that. And yeah, think, you, you're you know, gonna have a fee, uh, but you can, Ruth, I'm let sorry. me speak to that. I think somebody brought up, I can't remember who, when we go forward with the recommendation, I believe that this whole issue of the commons concept is one that we will probably say to the, the council that this is a subject of some anxiety, maybe amongst the committee, and certainly we perceive in the community. And, and the discussion probably won't stop. <laughs> 
just because we make a recommendation. That's, uh, that, this is an opinion on my part, but uh, I, I suspect that this is going to be an enduring conversation. With that, Bob? Ruth, I understand your concern. I'm also worried about if people get a bill, they're going to say, what's the city going to pay? That's going to be the first question. They're going to know that the city owns all this stuff. So they're going to ask, where is the city putting in their money? That's not going to be a surprise question. And the Commons fees an attempt to explicitly say, this is where that money is coming from. Yeah. And you may not buy that. I'm not asking. That's my logic. That's why I think calling it out and saying, this is our roads and streets is this. Your Commons fee. That would that'd be a helpful thing in my mind towards explaining the bill to everybody who's going to get it. Yeah, I don't know. I just... I think we can come up with the money without including okay. that and, you know, you, you, just with... A comment over here. I guess a couple things about this. I think with what you're saying, you can run into issues with people saying, well, I don't use those services. I don't go to... I don't make any or, You know, sure. But then, I mean, back to Ruth, I mean, if we aren't giving the city a bill, I don't see the need for a comments fee either. I mean, we're just trying to arrive at a number and we're putting it at $2 million right now. So, them getting... Whatever they're using it doesn't really matter in my mind a little bit, just because everybody else is going to be paying it anyway. So I don't, I don't see the need for a comments bill. Um, okay. Also, Rick, uh, when you say the city is going to pay it, bill, that's our money too. So I think that's going to be hard for people to, you know, we get into the shell game uh, discussion again. So I think it keeps it simpler without a comments fee. Um, and that way, you know, we're all contributing to the commons and whatever that formula works out to be. Well, instead of uh, unless we have exempt, you know, unless we start doing these property exemptions, and the commons fee actually, you know, you can be exempt all the way up to the commons fee because again, we go right back to the not unless we have a cap on those exemptions. Well, well, I don't yeah. think you could be exempt from everything just because, I mean, no matter. How many things you do, credits, or how many credits yeah. that you can get? I mean, you, you still have to arrive at a number. So I mean, if you're just paying less than your neighbor because of what you've done, you're not going to get down to zero. I mean, right. we still gonna have to get the number up. Yeah. So yeah. always going to have more. This space is being was being thrown out as right. something that would be completely exempt, and I, I'm some. Yeah, that's like a different issue, though. That's like, that's private issue. It's all part of it. Not completely. You know, when you look at these these issues, it needs to be across all of the the potential users. You can't do comments for just residents, but not for these open spaces. I mean, it's like it's comments means everybody. And if we agree on that, when we start, we can, you know, or if we don't, no matter what it is, but I mean, uh, maybe there's two recommendations. Yeah, we don't think comments are good, and yes, we think that here's why. But the comments establishes this foundation that everybody contributes. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, o uh, farmland or uh, open space, or you've got a, uh, an old quarry. And, and if, uh, couldn't that be established as well without a comments fee? That that's a part of the fee, that part of your fee includes a shared. Uh, you know, cost for city-owned land, city-owned streets, city-owned buildings. We're not going to separate those out. We're going to uh, spread it out on all that. All that's what it is. And that's what I mean. It's the same thing, and that's that's exactly what the commons fee is. It, it's I mean, something that gets spread out for everybody. Semantics. It's but it's a commons fee that we all share in on some basis that we haven't decided. It, it's a factor in the formula, so you got to call it something. So I think it's just a question: of what do you call it? Right. And it also enables you to charge in a different manner for our, for your plot makes X, your plot makes Y, all of our city makes Z. So we can bill on a different basis for the common part of the fee. It enables us to get a bit closer toward the individual basis. So I think that's what Terry and I both had in mind, that because we wanted to get billed on a much more individual basis, a much broader basis, the commons fee, than the parcel fee. Is that right, Terry? Yeah. Uh, we asked Jim to come and, and talk to us about the impact of exclusions and credits. Uh, and, and then we were going to start. 
dealing with the Congress. Couldn't you have Chris present his first? Because he's got a four yeah, page. I'm, uh, Four pages. Whatever the committee wants to do is. Let's hear from Jim first. I, 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 I'm ready to hear from Jim first. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. Right. Jim, you're on stage. I'm interested in hearing what Chris has to say. <laughs> I thought that was coming. Not that that matters. Uh, I don't really have a major. Uh, Chris, Chris, would you turn this seat and see how they Sure. Yeah. I so during the last meeting, at the end of the meeting, it was requested that we revise um, the different fee structure tables to exclude some properties. So what we're handing out is, Doug has a big table there with revised numbers with some property exclusions, for example. And what I'm handing out is a list of land use codes that show what properties were removed from the population. So this is the code that tell us what got got. Yeah. So, I mean, it gives you a snapshot. There's not a lot of mystery here. I think everybody gets it that if you exclude some properties, everybody else will, everyone else still goes up. And that's, and that's pretty much what you'll Thanks. see. I don't think I have a lot to add uh, beyond that. You can get a sense of what the changes are. So. Uh, I think the. Um, Wrapped up. All I wanted, all I wanted to say about this was that um, I think the discussion and presentation that Wayne gave really provides a lot more detailed insight into the types of properties that you might want to consider what to do with. Um, we did take a swing at specific land use codes and making some reductions, so you get a general sense of what the changes to the fees would be. But um, certainly, the information that Wayne presented, I think, was uh, was something that should be useful for the task force. So, Jim, what we should do is to compare the numbers on this sheet which says including exemptions to the other sheet that you passed out earlier, which does not say uh, exemptions, right? You should just compare the numbers in those columns. Would you like to do that, sure. So I'm a little confused here, Jim. I'm looking at the new chart, and I see Turkey Hill Farm still pays a substantial bill. So you did not include that type of conservation area, is that correct? Well, I guess we could have that should be zero. Yeah. What? It should, should be zero. zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Zero on mine. Zero on mine. I don't know. Mine doesn't have zero. <laughs> Just <laughs> zero on mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. On your side of the chart. Yeah, yeah. 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 zero on mine. Yeah. You got okay. zero. Yep. You're <laughs> saying quite down. No, that's, that's <laughs> no, you're right. The column right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the column leaves zero. The growth hoop went right down. I see that. No, no, but but that's the way it should happen. Calculation. Yeah. So would that change the numbers? Yeah. Just make it I'm sure it would by yeah. some tiny bit. Yeah. So just the cursory look, okay. the numbers go up. Yeah. Spend more, John. Just a quick question of the these exemptions. Has it been determined that the federal government is not building? They are building. Right. That, that's what I'm, I'm thinking that they are. And I think it's the wording of what the fee is. But I'm just wondering if anybody else has that the, same. The thought. VA hospital is building. Okay. Yeah. I do. I believe the state. State, Jimmy. Yeah. So ninety-one be billable? Is that? No. That's 
There is specific enabling legislation for the VA that makes it available. Yes, as part of the federal stormwater. Okay. Do you want more discussion on uh, Jim's uh, spreadsheet, or do you want to move on to Chris? Let's let's move on. And, and we yeah. Start, yeah. Uh, more on the debate. Thanks, Scott. Very good. Um, all right. Well, if you had a chance to take a look at the memo that I, I had asked him to circulate um, early last or late last week, what I attempted to do was based on information that Doug provided me was do a survey of um, a half a dozen communities um, to see how they were treating this idea of, of credits and incentives, um, and I'm not sure what the genesis of Doug's list was. <laughs> No. So random. A random sampling of, of communities around the country. Uh, so it's, it's not, first off, it's not exhaustive. Secondly, being random, I'm not sure it necessarily covers the whole spectrum of things that are out there. Um, and thirdly, it, 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 it's not a set of recommendations. So now that you know what it's not, uh, I want to speak briefly about what I saw as some of the common themes, and I think more research is needed in this area, particularly with regard to the exemptions. Um, there's a lot of material out there, and I, 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 I fully acknowledge that I didn't look at everything that all the communities had to, to look at with them. What I've focused on was each, each community offered some sort of credit or incentive, either to residential or non-residential, um, and they had a, an application process that set out criteria and how it would work. That was the commonality. They all had something. Uh, where they, and that was about all that they had in common. Um, in at least four of the locations, single family residences were not, not entitled to any credits or incentives. Um, more often than not, it focused on multifamily or commercial. And I think this probably has to do with their, the city's ability to um, audit it moving forward. Secondly, there was no attempt to reach back and credit things that were pre-existing. These were all things that they would do moving forward. Uh, thirdly, the incentives tended to take the form of um, uh, creation of uh, what they what is loosely referred to as green infrastructure. Uh, these can can be very small, but uh, potentially even larger, and they would focus around. Um, things like um, rain gardens and that type of thing. And then as far as where credits were given, they were given in a couple of different categories. Um, one had to do with volume of some sort, e either in slowing the rate of, of stormwater moving out. And I think in every case, what we're really talking about is routine stormwater. We're not talking about the 100-year storm. The, the, there's an acknowledgment that none of these systems were going to, that any of these systems, I think, would be overwhelmed by any sort of major Major thing. We're talking about the, the average, the average sort of abatement in the system. So focused on reducing overall um, flow over time, i.e., volume or rate, um, the quality of what was coming out, and that tend to focus on industry. Where, and in some cases, for for instance, in Richmond, where they had a very specific concern about um, uh, the local river there, uh, where they were willing to offer up to 100%. Uh, waiver of fee for for um, industries that complied with certain standards in the, in the locality. So I think that was a highly regionalized example. And then um, much smaller, but but offered fairly reg in 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 probably a third to half of them some sort of educational incentive, um, where and in in some cases they 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 specified the curriculum that had to be taught, um, where public or private educational entities usually. Um, not, not at the sort of under like K-12 that kind of thing, uh, focusing on the on the towns themselves rather than private entities like yours. Um, although oftentimes the in at least one case the curriculum was developed by um, by by local public university. Uh, some sort of some sort of incentivization uh, to do that. In some cases it was a percentage of 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 the rate. In others it was a per student credit. Um, and then finally, um, the range of credits varied fairly, fairly widely. In some cases, it was down in the 15% um, of, of your annual bill. In others, it was up to as high as 50%. So some communities have taken this really, really seriously as a way to 
um, do some incentivization of, of uh, again, and they approach it in different ways. It's, it's amount or quality are the two big ones. Um, I, I found the qualitative one interesting because obviously with regard to EPA, that's something that this community, well, we probably don't follow the Richmond model. Um, uh, uh, providing some incentivization for um, particularly industry uh, to do something around um, handling the problem before it becomes our problem was, I thought, an interesting approach to the model. So with that, you know, this is a really a cursory look at these things. I, I, I want to spend some more time on this to get, to find out, because what I think is more important is I've, I've looked at a range of options, but I haven't looked at how they're integrated into the individual, individual cities' plans, which I think is an important component of this. This, this tells you what some, what some people are, are thinking about, but it doesn't really talk holistically about how it integrates into how they treat the rest of the problem. Um, so I think what I'm probably going to do is narrow it down to a couple of a couple of others and spend this weekend getting much smarter about that portion of it. Um, and if anybody has any thoughts or questions, you have great. some idea of which two you're going to pick. Well, I like the Richmond model because we've got this we've got this very clear you know we got a river right there um, with industry that is being highly incentivized to do something on site to comply with a, a set. A set Kind of standard that there's there's a state reg that that these guys have to be in compliance with. Um, so I think that that's that's an interesting one. Um, I like South Burlington because um, they seem to be about our size um, and they are New England, so uh, they'd be subjected to the same types of climate issues that we are. Um, after that, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'd like to pick a third one that you know and. Um, I'm, 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 I'm inclined to lean away from Philly because it's just so mind-bogglingly complex. Uh, <laughs> They've had more time to develop um, their But I could, swap out, I could swap out Newton for South Burlington because they would be dealing with the same state regs that we are, and maybe that's something to think about. Um, uh, and then I don't really know anything about Griffin, Georgia, so I don't know. But, but Richmond, Richmond and either Newton or South Burlington would be definitely two of, of three. Um, and I'd be open to input on that other ones. Well, my opinion is this, and I don't know how the rest of the committee feels. Given the deadline that we face, I don't think it's realistic for you or for anyone to embark on a uh, huge study because I don't really don't think there's time. So my view would be to pick up what you thought were the relevant ones, unless there's some dissent. Uh, Look at those. John? Um, just took the sheet that the table one that was passed out last week. I just went through and made some notes. We're going off your comment of time frame. And just for the record, I just think that the May 31st date for recommendations is a little short. Um, I think the community expectations and the involvement, and I think the comment tonight about the impact of the financial to the community. I think in order to make it right, I go back to cohesive, comprehensive, and consistent. I, I think we're being forced. And I just wanted to, to state that you know, as I look through exemptions and caps, we really have one more meeting going back to two meetings ago where we said on the 14th we're going to make a recommendation, we're going to make it or not make it. And I just think we're pushing it. Um, you know, this week here, getting the information, I didn't have enough time this week you know, to really get the information accepted. Today we received a couple more models, and I think we have the information to work on. I don't think the time frame is here, and I just don't feel comfortable conceding just to make a recommendation that's going to be that foundation going forward. So I, I just think the 31st is too short of a time frame. I think we need to get uh, you know, adequate knowledge out to the public, um, and I think we should go back and say that the deadline can't be met, and we have to take the time to actually think this How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I disagree. I, I mean, I, I think it's important that we keep this deadline. I think that the city council needs to move forward, and I, I think that they're on a schedule, and we need to okay. get it done. And, and just, I agree 100 percent with that. I think it really depends on what our expectations of what we deliver is, and I agree with John that we can't come. I, there's no way we're going to have a single consensus-based recommendation, but I think we should 
provide the city council with what we have, <coughs> what, which may be seven options. I, I think that with our best bet, we could provide two different options of what it might look like. That's not shutting off all of the rest of the material that we have here. That's going to be passed on and it will be available right. to the council. And if the council wants to go right back through this and recalculate everything to get what they think is the way it should be done, well, that's their prerogative. And they may do that. God help you, Jim. <laughs> you know? And they may do that. Yeah. But, but I think that we could put together two different programs that show how we raise the fee and what options there may be. And you could even use, you know, try and calculate some of the exemptions. Um, I think what we're doing is really important and uh, not as urgent as the deadline indicates. Um, so I, I, I know that the DPW would take any of these plans, I think, and get that money and start working. But I, I think that we, I think we need to go through what's in front of us. I don't think we still have our hands around what's in front of us yet. Um, so it, it's close. I, I, it's close. I'd like to see where we are in a few weeks, you know, as we approach the well, I too don't believe we have nearly enough time to make a definitive bunch of decisions and single recommendation. I think it's our duty to provide what we have to the city council when they ask for it. You know, I, it's not going to be perfect. I hope it's complex and reflects all the kinds of discussions we have had. But if they ask for a report by the end of May, we should give them our best case and be done with it. Alex? Uh, Gee, I just, I, I, I'm kind of uh, with Rick. I, I, I just don't have my mind around base, some of the basic concepts here. I, I, from my point of view, I don't, uh, you know, there may be uh, plans presented in the next meeting or two that I can get behind, but I, I, right now, I, I don't feel like I have enough uh, knowledge or uh, of the, to make, to vote. Well, I kind of agree with Megan and, and with Jim. We have till the end of May. We're giving them recommendations. We're not making decisions. We've got basic ideas. We said on the 14th we would go to the city council, but we really don't have to. We have until the end of May. Then we take our information, the things that we've put together, and we're making recommendations. So we've got all the information that we've gathered, all the work that we've done. We put it on paper and we give it to, to, well, I guess it's the joint BPW city council that we give it to. But there are recommendations. There are ideas and our thoughts and all the work that we've done. And then if they say, well, you've gone this far, we want you to keep going, we can keep going. But it would be their decision. We're, we're giving them our recommendations of what we've done so far. Is there harm asking for time? I mean, no. you say the recommendation. My biggest fear is we're going to put all these recommendations on the table, and that information usually is the information that something's judged by. I don't think there's any harm at all in asking for time, but I think we should give them what we've got. Because we, we decided as a group that the 14th was the date to make a decision, not the 31st. We said well, the 14th. We're going to make a, be able to make a decision by the end of the month. So we have next right. meeting, and that's it. Unless, well, the 14th. Again, but that we no, no, but the 9th is before the 14th, so the information that we get next week is really what well, we have to make a decision if we can make the recommendation. I don't think we agreed we were going to make a decision by the 14th. We were going to decide if, if we, we can make it and make the death right. But yeah. the information that we have is yeah. going to be by next yeah. meeting. Chris? Yeah, we could always do that. I think I agree with, unfortunately, with uh, Alex and, and Bob, which is I, I still feel I have some questions about some fundamental issues that, that I think we need to address. But I also think that... Um, Given the pace of, of progress over the last couple of meetings, I, I think we're I think we're I think we're really close to being able to provide usable materials um, in the time frame that 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 we were asked to to, to work within. And uh, 
Um, I would be perfectly happy if on the 31st, when we turn this over or shortly thereafter, if the council said to us, um, this, is, this isn't sufficiently polished and we, and, we, and we want a little more of your time. Uh, because it would then be them asking us to, to continue our diligence and accommodating our time frame, you know, giving us more leeway in, in a construct that they put together. Um, because, you know, I really do want to, I really do want to meet the deadline that they meant mentioned so that they can move forward in a timely manner and if they feel that um, they need to give us more time so that we can do more work for them then I think that 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 would be not a bad way for it to play out but I, I really do want to give them and I think we can give them something usable by the 31st can I just add one uh, on the, once we once we sign off once we move this material to the City Council I have long experience on the City Council a group like this isn't going to meet again. This kind of deliberation won't happen. I think by default, uh, a lot of stuff will go to the DPW. Uh, and I think that, for better or for worse, uh, that's where the, if we don't come up with a, with, a, with a usable plan that the city council can understand and get behind, then we really will default to the DPW. But what are the steps we need to take to get to that point? I mean. Do we need to set out some items that we all need to do our own research on and come ready to <coughs> vote on, or well, I think do what, we need to? What Chris said earlier about yes. what it's going to act, what our recommendations are actually going to look like, I think is really important. So maybe we might want to put that on the agenda. Like, what what is it that we want to turn over? Are we going to turn over seven different options? Yeah, who's going to produce it? What's going to look like? Right, right. Well, there might be a subcommittee to, to put that together. Because I think if we're, if we're facing a deadline <clears throat> that we want, you know, either the 14th to, to ask for an extension or to actually give them something on the 31st, um, we need to at least have some consensus of uh, what, what that's going to look like. We, we, well, we've got time. Let's talk about it. <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, we, we've got several proposals that have some backup of the thought process. That is a good starting point, I think. But all of those those issues that keep coming up for this group again and again, one is comments, fees, yeah. um, exemptions, um, caps, caps, which we haven't talked about yeah. yet. Um, and you know, I, I, mean, I, I think that's we've got a couple of models that are they're different in, in some pretty big ways, and they're kind of similar in how they come out financially, which is interesting. I think it's more important that we sort of focus on that fair and equitable. And these two major definitions that that we need to bring to the city council. And it's helpful to see the one with the exemptions to see what that exemption does to everybody's cost. Mm -hmm. That gives me more information about all four of the models. Here. Right. Well, here's the situation as I see it. I think the council meets tonight, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're meeting now. And so then they meet again on the 16th. Two weeks, yeah. And then I don't know if they meet on the 30th or not. No, two no. meetings a month. Two meetings. Two meetings. So, <laughs> I, I'm not one to, to surprise people if I can help it. So, uh, they're meeting tonight, and the council is going to meet on the 16th, and then they're not going to meet again until June. And if we have some notion that we can't or aren't going to get our work accomplished, I think we are obligated to go to them on the 16th and tell them what the situation is. I mean, we could communicate it to them before that, of course. Uh, and so I wanted to go around the table and see where our, our committee, in, as the whole, is. And I'm, I'm not going to, as chair, try this one way or another. <coughs> Maybe it's if, in, if you were in a private industry situation, Emory? the boss man was down on the table and said, we're going to get it done. That's not what we have here. Emory? We have an entirely different situation, and so I think we need to come together, at least from my point of view, just a minute, just a minute, uh, to make that decision, and that's why I went around the table, because I wanted to get everybody's view on it. Now, Ruth. I think what we have a slight problem here. We don't go straight to city council. We have to go to the BPW city council joint committee. That's who we're supposed to report to. Uh, Paul Spector appointed me and asked me to get this started. 
He's on and, that committee. And, and my he's opinion is, I'm going to go back to Paul Spector yeah. he's and on tell that him committee. what the situation is and let him figure out how to work this bureaucracy. I'm not... Paul um, is on that committee. Yeah, and so I'm, yeah. I, I feel he's, he's the person we owe the communication yeah, to. Yeah. Can we have him here at the next meeting? Well, we, certainly we can invite him, absolutely, yeah. I think, yeah. We, I think we should invite him and let him uh, you know, see where we're at. Uh -huh. Good idea. Is there an interim meeting of the subcommittee before our next meeting? Then, I believe it's the first or the second Monday of the month, which would be the Thursday. 13th? 13th. Second yeah. Monday of the month? Yeah, 13th. that's the 13th. That's what my calendar says, <laughs> anyway. Well, that's what could be answered. Yeah. By our next meeting, where he wants it. Public hearing, seven p.m. Council chambers. Be in between. What public hearing is the council chambers? Time for us to yeah. close with that. And, and then it would mean that Paul had to come here. The DPW representatives would tell us. Fine. Two of them. David, thank you. I have a couple of uh, comments just on what was said. You you mentioned. Clear, concise. What, what were your adjectives? Consistent. And consistent. So uh, I'm sure that you know it's difficult. We've done a great job to date, but we haven't been clear, or consistent. There's been confusion, and that's if that's confusion within the committee. You can imagine how the public is perceiving what we're doing, because it's a struggle for us because it's a fluid thing and we're working through some things. So John's point is well taken that if we're not clear and consistent and concise through this. Uh, and to Alex's point, those words have a lot of iron, and that the perception is, based on what I'm hearing, is that once this committee disbands, that it will become a function of the BPW that's already driving a lot of this in the public perception and mine, and that that will go to that committee, and that they will sanitize and scrub everything that we've done to make it work for that committee to process it through, my opinion. And lastly, is that we have a charge that we have struggled to stick to. And in that, we keep coming back to equity, equitable, and transparent. And it's, we're, str we're struggling with the equitable part, whether it's commons. I think in one of these uh, drafts, no disrespect, but I'm not sure what draft and what we're looking at, and if the numbers add up. Uh, and if we're, we're not sure, I'm guaranteeing you general public is not sure that one number in the commons fee went from, I think in Dan's number, went from 400 to 839,000 or 639,000. Took a huge jump, and that speaks to your issue. And we haven't started talking about caps. We haven't talk, started talking about exemptions. And it's May 2nd. We have a couple of meetings. And I think those meetings alone are going to take us and sidetrack us for transparency down many different roads. So I'm all for deadlines because I am the guy that pounds like this every day of my life. <laughs> um, but in terms of what our charge is to the public, the deadline was incorrect, incorrectly given. Uh, I apologize for my anger two meetings ago when I brought that up. Um, but I feel like the football player that got to the one yard line and then the ref said, you got another 20 yards to go. So I'm not sitting here looking to put my name again to anything that we cannot clearly, concisely deliver to the general public, which is our charge here, and that's what we need to stick to. Thank you. Quick explanation of, I was looking at that number. Okay. I think that comes because the city, I had originally included the city as a pair. Yes. That, that got that pushed back out I don't know to the comments. That's why it's a confusion. Though. Just that's to a, just to eliminate it. I'm you know. sorry I used your name. Oh no, no, no. Okay. I'm just saying that, that that's where that number that was the where where, where it comes from. Right. Because that was a significant change in the those two tables. I just remember when I first got the email from my councilwoman asking if I was interested and it had a forward from Paul Spector and that email said we would like you to spend about six weeks on this as a committee. I just remember that from that email. I don't know if everyone else saw that email. So my expectation of what we were going to put forward was just like 
a group of the public is going to get together, look at these things, and make a recommendation. And it, and it had, it's going to, it has to be as fair and equitable as we can make it, but it's what their expectations are that a group can produce in six weeks. So um, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I will help our final right. report has got ample room for each of our individual voices. So if you want to write XYZ and Rick wants to write ABC, you can have whatever you want to write, your concerns. That's, that's what we're going to need to do to get a report we can all put our names on. I think what David said really you know, helped me to understand a little bit better on this, on this schedule. We are, they have asked us to um, put our heads together and come up with the most fair, transparent system to raise this money. And if we don't feel like we're, we're at that point, like, you know, if we're still confused about comments fees and exemptions and, um, and we're just throwing everything that we've just sort of piled together, at city council let them decide. I don't think we're doing what we need to do. Um, so, you know, I, I've got to think about what you said as far as time-wise. I'm sure the quicker we do it, the happier we'll be, but is that really the best um, approach to this? Our, recommend, our recommendation could be that this continue because, you know, I think fair and equitable applies to the community as well. I don't think anybody signed up thinking this is going to be a three month or a three year could be because there's issues here that I mean we're not going to hit perfect and I, we're not no <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe you know maybe that's part of our report this is, this is where we're at this really should be these need to be these issues need to be addressed before it goes any further and that would be honest and if the, if they decided to ignore the task force recommendation for continue for either forming another task force or getting anybody who's willing here to continue to do it, then they can deal with it and the BPW can, can go down in the front of the ship because that's what will happen. And, and I appreciate that too, Dan, because that's exactly what I would like them to take a public vote ignoring our recommendation because that, that, that gives us the credibility that we did our job. Or vote for it. Either way. I'm fine with either way, but it's a public vote that the public sees that it's the city council did it, not us. Yep. Also, I, I think Owen uh, Freeman Daniels, my counselor, who we first, this was brought up several months before we even first met. So I, I know that this has been in the works and we were not tasked until you know, our first meeting with this. So there was a, there was a big delay on it at the outset, getting well, us together. Well, we weren't even really tasked until we had two or three meetings. The right. final, the right. final uh, document. Uh, well, you know, I'm one for getting meetings over promptly. And so, you know, we've got several items to do. We've talked about the credits. Take on the next one. We could do the comments. Uh, but before we do that, it, it seems almost certain we're going to need another meeting. Yeah. And probably next week. But we've been meeting every week. And, you know, I've been, we've been really doing due diligence. So the question I want to start now a little bit early, do you want to meet again next week? Yes. Yeah. 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 Any chance we can meet earlier? Than 5.30? Yeah, we meet at 5. 5's okay with me. Okay. I can meet at 9. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute. Wait, wait, we're still out of control here. We <laughs> meet at 5 next week, that'd be a little bit better for me. I got something to do later on, so I want to. Keep down I'm going to have to leave early anyway. So Anything to help you out? Bye. Sure. Bye. <laughs> Just remember, if those Sterling engines don't start, baby, you're the first guy down. You all, you owe us all. <laughs> so it's five to seven next week, and I'll, I'll put the agenda together. But so we've got that bit of thing done here. Let, let's talk about the commons. I don't quite know where to start on the commons. Has somebody got an idea on the commons? Yeah, let me, let me, <laughs> yeah, so let me just speak this up. There, the simplest version is zero. You can do commons what? You can do just city-owned properties, parking lots paid. You can, and then you can take in state property and the federal highway. So the full commons 
I would argue, if all the roads, whoever owned them, and all the parking lots and, and buildings owned by the government in Northampton, and that, I think, could be as much as 13%. The, the simpler version, the, just the city version, which is what I think Dan used, is like 21%. No? The first time. Okay. But then when we voted to not include okay. the city as its own billing entity, it okay. all, it all, it's the whole same, it's the same to that. So 30%. So, th Plus so that's, that's right. a generous allowance, and that takes, that counts any plausible publicly owned non-impervious circumstances. And that may be too hard. I'm not saying that's what it should be. But if the logic is that the commons benefits us all, whoever owns it, then it should be a relatively high number. Uh, Bob, would you be willing to come to the next meeting and lay out those two alternatives in enough detail that we could I'd be happy to uh, get people either to vote yes or no yes. Or, or, or amend it or whatever? Yes, I'd be happy to. And I'll circulate it before the meeting so we can look at it and see what the actual numbers are. Oh, and then you can just put the points. commons numbers into the models. Because if we agree on a model, for the commons that eliminates some of the uncertainty between Absolutely. these models we have here. And so your proposal would be that that commons number... I'm just going to say that commons white is X and commons big is Y. So that would be a separate line item on each bill as a commons... Depends which model we... Not if we take Ruth's model, of course. If we take Terry or my model, then that commons factor would have a coefficient, which is scientific. <laughs> and a separate line on each bill. Yeah, it's not on the bill, that's the bill's calculation. Although, you're right. The bill's calculation. So I'll be happy to do that. Chris? Can I also ask, um, if, as you do this, you um, highlight what the differences between the two are and, yes. and, 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 and why you think, yeah. how, how they hold together right. okay. logically? Okay. okay, I'd be happy to do that. Great, thanks. You got something? What is it? No. Oh, I saw your hand. No, I got something in my eye. <laughs> okay, okay. Not tears. <laughs> uh, we were going to have a, we are going to have a discussion on caps. That was a issue. Galax. Well, the common fee again. Uh, back I, whether it's it's light or heavy. Whether and I, I understand uh, coming up with a with a dollar number for that common fee. What I don't uh, find the next leap is if you're going to apportion, apportion that people's part of that commons fee on the same <coughs> basis that you're apportioning the rest of their uh, the fee on square area, then, uh, then I... Uh, it makes no difference in that case. That's not what Terry or I do. We well, don't use the same basis for paying for the commons that we do for the parcel fee. Oh, I it's got it. It's a whole different set of numbers that it's based on. It's gross area. Yeah. And the, the gross area and impervious... Property. Right, and but it's but, but so it's not it's not it's, but, but they it's, it's unrelated to the but they don't they aren't they don't parallel one another they don't mirror one another it really is an attempt to get the commons fee paid for more broadly that's I mean that's a big part of the discussion Alex yes. I think is you know is how do you determine is it a per property owner you know if it's the commons is that what it is it's you know Smith pays the same as Bob for the commons. Or is it based on the number of cars that park there? Or the number of people that occupy it during right. the day? Or the number of birds that are in the trees? I mean, there's so many different ways that you can approach it. But we, that's where we're going to have the difficulty, I think. Is okay. how that's the it. discussion I'd like, like to be involved in. I haven't really heard of that. Oh, we want you to come to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and that should, that should be relatively early on the agenda every next week if I can answer Commons, right? What? Commons, yeah. Well, you right? we'll, we'll put you as early as we can. Sure. Uh, discussion on caps. There was a suggestion, um, more than one suggestion, we ought to have caps. And, uh, so caps can mean three different things, it seems to me. There can be a cap on the total fee, the maximum fee anybody has to pay. Could be set at X dollars. There could be a cap on the rate. Now, we are not going to have any real impact on what the rate should be, because that's really going to be determined by the model that gets adopted and the budget. And they, if we can recommend, you can't charge more than 12 cents per cubic square foot, whatever it happens to be. They're not going to pay any attention to that. 
I mean, I um, am. So that's the, the, whole, yeah, the overall I, dollar amount that the max total you're going to raise. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I read in, in uh, one of the exemption uh, things that uh, also there can be a cap on the exemptions. In other words, right. uh, yeah. the exemptions may go for five years and it's capped at that. Or a cap on the total amount of money. Right. Is there a third cap off? You gave I, th I said there were three, and I, yeah. the, the third one must be that. Rate increase? I have oh, total that's rate and yeah. exemption. Yeah. Total rate and exemption. Okay. If I, with, we can, the rate we can recommend it, sure. Sure. I, but right. it, <laughs> no, I understand. But that's, our, that's so. our charge to recommend. Yeah. To recommend what caps, formula. What caps we would like to yeah. implement. We certainly could consider that. I agree, but I'm not sure it had much of that. Mm -hmm. no, I think that's important. Chris has a cap on exemptions, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, I've got yeah. to have yeah. that down. So are there four caps that were presented that we could... We total could dollars? Rate, total fee. Total uh, fee. Total fee. Mean total collected by... Total fee per pay per, per owner. And, and the rate and the, and the change in the, in the increase in rate, because those are two different yeah. things. And exemptions. Well, I mean, there's, like, there's also the, a total budget, which I'm not... Yeah. Sure. Right. Should be like that's two million. That's yeah. that. <laughs> well, yeah. right. well, and it yeah. can go yeah. up. I, and, right. I don't know if we can actually say that or not, but as maybe we, maybe we recommend it. Yes. Like yeah. 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 We're not in a position to actually have any expertise on what that is. Uh, yes. right? Yeah, that's not, not nothing that we've looked at. In detail. A lot of opinions, though. and we have heard from the experts who say we yeah. need to do it. Uh, some experts. Well, we have eleven different opinions, I think. Yeah. <laughs> who, who is willing to work on uh, putting together these? All cap alternatives. Could I just ask Chris? You looked at fee credits and incentives. You didn't look at caps when you went through those. Uh, no, but when I go back, I'll look at I'll look at that. that that's part of the, part of the failing of the work that I've done so far is that it wasn't. In, no, no. Yeah, trust okay. me, it's not. It's not. The work that I've done hasn't integrated into mm -hmm. these other issues. So, um, for instance, you know, I looked very only cursorily at the treatment of nonprofits, which was something that came up last. Nobody touches that. They 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 they, they, they bring them all in. Um, but but uh, there are other things. There are other questions that I haven't asked yet, and I'd be more than happy when I go back and do this scrub to look at caps. And fundamentally, caps. I mean, I was talking with uh, uh, Dan Knabik in Westfield. I mean, they had a cap because it doesn't work mm -hmm. for them. I mean, their caps aren't raising enough money. I was right going to say Westfield right. imploded. But, yeah, it sure did. But they started with a cap. <laughs> yeah. Because to make it to make it to make it to get it rolling. It's like mm -hmm. yeah. you're going to raise five hundred thousand. You know, next year maybe you raise a million. Maybe the year after it's two million. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. but it allows a, a sort of eased transition into it, which is. They had a cap on their commercial property too. Yeah, yeah, like right. yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm more than happy to look at okay. what the communities are doing with regard to caps, that, but but I but I'm but I'm I am i am not volunteering for this other thing. The other okay, part. no, I hear you. Okay. I understand. You you got an update, I think. Can we have some committee, Ned and, and Jerry, um, on the two million dollar figure, since we're talking about caps? Do you see that going up? You see that as a steady figure for five years. Is there a is there a um, are, are we looking at you know windows that we we want it that rate and then we know we're going to inflation or whatever is going to dictate a change in that number? Or we, or can we think about two million dollars for the next ten years? Well, I think it's going to be project driven. What well, projects that need to be done by the city or by the Department of Public Works yeah. is going to drive what price is going to be. Any year, so if we have a failure of a major drain system in the city. Yeah, we have to raise funds to fix it. We should have <coughs> projects scheduled at <coughs> regular intervals as we upgrade our system. But if we have a catastrophic failure or something, that two million caps not going to work. Yeah, but, but see, well, this is still a discussion because if, if if that happens and it's a, it's all oh, now we need six million. Yeah. You know, if the rates go up, we're going to have two hundred. That's right. So no, and, and the desire, what the, the desire is that we have this pot of money sitting around for those projects. Yeah. That's a that, well. That's part of the discussion. I mean, it's you know our at some discussion. point our discussion because you know I mean that's where the cap on the overall budget could come in because at some point maybe it, when that happens it falls into an override because yeah. we lose fair and equitable at some point to everybody mm -hmm. uh, if, we're, if we're tripling. That, that figure, 
without any kind of predictor. Um, the, the two million was based on on what when when you when you arrived at that what was Terry what what did you what did you basically see? that would give us enough money to meet the obligations the obvious obligations we can see coming up between flood control and what we anticipate the EPA is going to require of us. Optimistic or pessimistic? No. Re reasonably <laughs> realistic. 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 No. And it includes $500,000 for new projects. So 1.5 for anticipated? $500,000 for new projects, which for example, just for a sense of scale on North Street, we just spent about half of that amount, a little less than half of that amount to put in 4,000 feet of drain pipe for this reconstruction that's about to occur. Um, now, just again, as a sense of perspective, if we keep up that pace of putting in 4,000 feet of drain pipe every year, it's gonna be a century <laughs> before we get back around, it's gonna be about 120, 130 years before we get back to North Street. So we're not spending enough even at what we just spent and it took the city three years to come up with that money. Right. We've been actually postponing the reconstruction of North Street because the city was struggling to come up with the two hundred twenty-five thousand. So, so does two million sort of fall under that? You know, I think that's going to be an amount of money palatable. that will keep us in good shape. But but is it is it just simply a palatable number now that that's necessarily going to go up even if we don't have an emergency? Which we probably will because the system is so I understand. It's it's my thought that, that is in fact a reasonable flat line number. But we're just not gonna take some of the projects that the CDM report mentions. There's no way we're gonna spend twenty million dollars to eliminate the potential for that lake under the railroad bridge across from Dunkin' Donuts. That's, that's just not gonna happen. That's a wish list. That, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a wish list. Wish list. No. Yeah, it wasn't it's even a, a wish list. Yeah. But what is the adjusted rate of inflation? Was that calculated in there at all over five years or seven years? No. So would you, could, if the public, if the public asked me, if, if somebody asked me, it, it's going to be $2 million a year for how many years? Could I say five years before we think about raising it or lowering it, it's going to be... I mean, is there any predictability to that at all? Because once we have this in place, then the board, you know, the BPW is going to be in charge of this rate, and we're at that. Not necessarily. Well, no, that's something else we need to do. Oh, okay, well, yeah, somebody's going to be in charge of, uh, of fixing that budget. The, so. the, the only real wild card that we can foresee is the pump station that many of you toured on Monday. The problem with that is that that building doesn't meet many of the current building codes, and that trick there is going to be to begin chipping away at the expenses that we need to put into that without somehow triggering the requirement that we just simply start from scratch. That's the only real wild card that's out there at the moment. And it's a $500,000 engine. Yeah, we talked a little yeah. bit about this. I was quizzing Jim last meeting about, you know, full you know, upgrades as opposed to full replacement value. But that's separate from the, the $2 million budget that we're talking about right well, that's the $2 million is, is the pot of money that any flood pump, pump station replacement would come from. But replacing that, if we come to that decision, is a, is a it way, it blows $2 million out. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it would be bonded. Like a, yeah. Bonded. So $2 million would contribute to it. I'd just like to see yeah. some predictability to that figure. If it's really going to be $3 million, let's talk about it. That's, that's my concern, because I, I don't want to get suckered into a, you know, a low fee knowing that there's something coming bigger. Yeah. Jim, Jim had a comment he wanted to make. You, you, it's passed. Okay. Who, who wants to go next? No, Jim. Is, Jim. Oh, you know, the, the two million is a figure that the DPW would use to do bonding, the same as the CPA. The CPA did the ball fields on Meadow Street by a bonding, and they're taking so much a year out of that. Uh, 200,000 that they get, and uh, we, we would have to do the same as the DPW. So we have that in, in yeah, and kind of like two million dollars high, right? Yeah, and just to address uh, Rick's uh, point about predictability, and correct me if I'm wrong, but five years ago, seven years ago, when the economy was better, 
that 4,000 square foot of road might have cost 800 grand because people were busy. You, you had a low price as time went away. And asphalt was $35 a ton versus 75 now. So as, as yeah. the economy ebbs and flows, the $2 million right. buy you a lot or not, not buy you anything. And that, and even inflation, adjusted mm -hmm. inflation, they won't take that into account. Yeah. So two million, you know, for, what, what did you say, North Street, five hundred thousand? Uh, no, actually, it's about half of it. Okay, so you know, it could be, it's not going to be half of that again. I can guarantee you, but it could be double. Yeah. So the predictability here of two million dollars away <coughs> uh is subject to a lot of other outside pressures. Well, yeah, we're here at seven thirty. Uh, we've we've we got. We started on the discussion of caps. We've got a couple of uh, assignments that we're going to get for the next meeting. <clears throat> uh, how much longer do you want to go as a committee? I mean, you get to decide. Tonight? Tonight? I think we're done. Okay. Think we're done. No. Yeah, no, right. And so Mr. Kirby had his hand up, and we didn't recognize him, but I lost we said. my muscle control. Okay, lift it down. <laughs> Are you up for a couple of minutes? Yeah, well, that's, yes, oh, we are. Okay. Two things bother me. A lot of things bother me. Two things bother me. Okay. That if the, if the committee is going to recommend that the city be exempt, the representatives on the board that represent the DPW should bow out, should essentially exempt themselves. Because the, the, in terms of it comes close to conflict of interest. Not the, the, the people that are just voted on it to represent the, the community, but the institutional representatives. Anyone from the BPW want to Chris, I'm from the BPW. I'm, I'm not a city employee. I'm a, I'm, I'm a volunteer for that as I'm a volunteer for this. There's a, there's a ground. Okay, I just want to raise that. The second part is this CDM report everybody should look at because it's not just a wish list. And the pumping station is not just a wild card. It is a disaster waiting to happen. And the price tag on that is, I think, about $17 million. And also that whole, mar that whole Market Street and the whole, uh, the old culvert that takes the William Street book, that's way beyond. It's, it's got planking on the, on the thing. Essentially, this is a politically palatable figure that can slide through. But I think as members of the committee, you need to realize that the real bills are going to be really big. Thank you very much. Other comments? I guess I have one more, and I'm, I'm concerned about uh, you guys quitting too fast not giving adequate uh, thought to fair and equitable in, in what you hand to either the task force or the city council. And I don't think either the task force or the city council can put the mental mu muscle into deciding a fair and equitable plan out of your, your group if you don't do it yourself. So you've got to come up with a plan that's fair and equitable, and you should have several plans and rate them. This is the fairest by some degree. This is next fair, so forth and so on. And that should be done before you finish. The other thing is I would like to see a consistent set of numbers. I looked at ta the first table you had, the second table, different numbers. 42% different, that's a lot. I don't mind 1 or 2%, I can live with that. I can live with 5 or 6%, but the larger numbers I can't. Now there's some question about you're getting data from 2011 versus 2005. That should be straightened up before you guys finish. The other thing about your deadline is my understanding is you're creating an enterprise fund. And if you look at the city ordinances, you'll see that there were two enterprise funds created in 1988, which was water and sewer, and several more. There was one for the swimming pool at JFK, I believe. Yep. There was also there was a swimming pool. There was also one for the landfill. So from 1988 to now is like 25 years. So this could have been done any time in those 25 years, and which it should have been, by the way. Uh, so why rush it to, what's the big rush now? What's the big rush now? I think you said at the last meeting that the deadline, or the meeting before, the deadline for this was not dependent on the flood control station. Is that correct? 
part of it is we have the Army Corps of Engineers and a list of maintenance items and studies that need to be done on flood control. And then we have the MS-4 permit from the EPA. That's right. But I'm pretty sure at the previous meeting, or the one before that, you said that this deadline, you wanted it for what, October 16th or 17th? I believe Jim may come into that, but um, they won before the, the ballot election, this, or before they set the tax rates. Otherwise, it would hold off for another full year. Right. I mean, my point is this has been going on, could have been done many years ago, so a little bit more time, what's it going to do? So if you guys got to spend another month? Well, you know, those are good comments, and I would encourage you to take those to city council because they're the good people that, uh, that set the dates and took the committee here, and, and we've talked about changing the date amongst ourselves here, and we haven't come to a consensus to do that. There's clearly some discomfort on the committee, but I think the city council is the appropriate uh, place to make those views known. David, no, I, I, I have one question, uh, and Jim, you could help me. I mean, uh, the CDM report was just referenced again by either uh, George or Mike, and then I think you referenced the CDM report in one of your bullet points back to Jim or vice versa. And my recollection from three meetings ago was that we weren't referencing the CDM report at all anymore. So I just wanted to have that clarified. Are we or aren't we? We're not in my, in my opinion. Okay. I uh, thank you for that clarification. So will you reference the CDM report back in your comments, or are you still referencing the CDM no, report? No, I, I, refer <coughs> I made the reference that they are projecting increases. Okay. Just as a... And we've just discussed that right here, but that was, you know, regardless, I think the CDM report has some had some fundamental flaws in what they were looking at, but the way the way that they approached it and a lot of the information in there the is was excellent. So it's sort of like, you know, do you throw the whole thing out and say, well, just disregard this thing? Well, so, well, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but just they kind of dealt with things that they probably should for be. For good money for it, too. I understand. But, yeah. you don't <laughs> want to but for the record, the, the DPW, I believe, is on record that you're not using it anymore. And that's the key point that I, I wanted to clarify for myself. Are we done? Uh, I'd like to thank all the committee members for their, their time and the work they put in. put in A lot of people have put a lot of work in. I'd like to thank the DPW for the work they've done. They've done a hell of a lot of work we've just not seen in the background. I, I appreciate that, and I think the committee appreciates it. Thank you, sir. I'm not doing much better. I don't know if you're a